afternoon, everybody. You're very welcome to our August uh, in the veg patch. Uh, lovely to see so many people. And um, we've got a really, really busy sort of a <clears throat> session coming up um, uh, because we've got lots of questions that people have submitted in advance, I think. So probably about uh, 25 or 30 questions to get through, Richard. So I hope you're feeling sprightly today. Uh, okay, so um, and we've got two uh, two different topics that we want to cover. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about onions as a, as a general thing, how to grow them and uh, what to be doing with them. And we're also going to talk about seed saving. So uh, we're going to kick off uh, straight away because we've got lots of stuff to get through. So uh, Richard, how is how has the last month been since we talked last in the in the veg patch? Things are getting a little bit better. It's been a, a slightly sunnier August than July, uh, but unfortunately the plants decided in July that autumn was on the way and everything seems about three or four weeks more advanced than it should be. I did the final deleafing on the tomatoes yesterday. That's normally a job for the third or fourth week in September. So yeah, it's not been too bad, but um, uh, July did a lot of damage and things felt that the summer was coming to an end, I think, at the beginning of August. So, yeah, uh, it's bounced back a little bit, though, right? I think. Yes, uh, yeah, yes. yeah. OK, very good. So um, let's talk about onions, onions specifically. Um, uh, so generally speaking, when when we talk about growing onions, I think for me as as a home grower, I grew them for a long time using using sets, which are basically kind of mini onions uh, that somebody else has grown from seed. And it's sort of you typically be sowing sets, um, I guess, around March or April, Richard. And then and I would definitely go April. Uh, a little bit of knowledge of physiology of onions goes a long way here. Uh, an onion uh, is a biennial, which means it grows one year, flowers the next and you don't want it to flower that's called bolting with an onion so um if you put an onion set in too early it starts growing and then thinks it's had a winter when it gets a cold spell in april and then bolts on you so um and the larger the onion set the more likely it is to know that it's uh, had a cold spell so if you're buying onion sets buy the smallest you can get and put them in in april yeah okay um, and then a couple of years ago, you got me onto the idea of growing onions from seed, which I sort of. No, you mean you took my onions out of the glass house and planted them. But anyway, anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did that the first year. This the last few years I've done it myself, in fairness. But um, which is like I always assumed this would be, you know, having done it, having grown onions using sets for years, I thought maybe it's very complicated uh, to grow, uh, to grow them from. Uh, seed but actually it's very straightforward and you but you start very early like so they're almost the the first uh thing that you would sow in the year if, if yeah not they deep. are yeah the first thing i start the propagating season off from the onions the reason being another bit of onion physiology uh they are programmed around about midsummer to stop producing leaves and start bulbing the more leaves they've got, the bigger the balls will be, the onions. So you need a very long growing season. They're quite slow growing initially. So I get them in in January. So that means that by the time transplanted them out in April, uh, they then have a nice big plant with lots of leaves uh, come midsummer. Then you'll get a big onion. Yeah. And it can also sort of scratch the itch of wanting to sow something in January, which is often not a brilliant idea to sow things too yeah, early. It, it so keeps you, can... you calm anyway, Mick. You know, you get overexcited with your tomatoes and things. But... Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I do. I do like it. Now, you also taught me a thing I, which is very useful, um, where we're sowing onion seeds in at the end of January, say, in module trays. But instead of doing one seed per module, we're, we're doing three or four and and that means you get a little cluster of seedlings effectively that we're planting out talk to us a little bit about why why you do it that way right well uh, uh, you would need a lot of an awful lot of modules if you're putting one seed in each one because you, you know you put a lot of onions out and uh, so that's a waste of propagating space and compost and so on um they don't mind being together at all 
um, and is, is less work for transplanting. I put, well, actually, I have a lot more seed than that in because I also take a scallion crop. So I maybe put 10 seed in a module and then thin them in May, uh, early June uh, for scallions for the kitchen here, thin them to four or five in each module and then uh, leave them. And I plant them one every 30 centimetres, about 30 centimetres either way each module. So uh, the amount I need here to keep the chef happy, I would have I wouldn't have enough propagating space if I was putting them in singly, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I d I've done them that way the last few years and I, I harvested onions uh, last weekend actually at home and had an amazing, an amazing yield from doing them that way. So as you say, I've been using sort of baby onions and um, the smaller ones as spring onions and as small, small onions for, their, for, for months now and then harvested, you know, the ones that leave behind, that you leave behind are kind of turning into much bigger onions and harvested mm -hmm. last weekend. And I reckon I probably got maybe 300 onions at home, which is which is brilliant. And they're all different sizes as well, which is actually really good to have from a kind of kitchen perspective, because you've got, you know, if you need a small onion, there's one there. If you need a big onion, there's one there as well. So it's a great way to do it, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, the only thing is uh, you do need to either have glass, well, ideally glass house or certainly a polytunnel. And to start them that early, you need a heater propagating mat. They're not something for a windowsill. They really do need full that time of year is not much light and they need full light or growing lamp, I suppose, either. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you do need a, a proper setup if you don't have that set up by onion sets. Yeah. OK. All right. So ch check but just to remind ourselves then time frame wise. So if we're growing from seed, we're starting them in January, but you have to have a uh, you have to have a heated mat or some kind of a heated propagator for them if you're growing them from and, sets. And full sun. Yeah. And full sun, um, but not artificial light. Yeah, if you get a proper grow light, um, uh, they, they would do the trick. You don't necessarily need that, though. Um, but no, you don't. If you have a, a glass house or polytunnel, I wouldn't trust a south-facing window that time of year. OK. If you're growing from sets, then you're what you're saying, wait till uh, for, like wait first till week April, in April? Buy small sets and put them in April. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then they get less likely to bolt on you. OK, so then you're uh, obviously the sets you're doing direct in the soil, the seeds you're doing in module trays uh, with the seeds. When would you be transplanting out the seedlings from the module trays? Uh, usually around April. They don't grow fast. Nothing in that family grows fast. Leeks are very slow as well. Yeah. Uh, so you want always the transplanting. Things are ready when the roots have occupied all of the compost in the module. That's yeah. when they're ready to go out uh, so that Usually about eight weeks from sowing, that sort of thing. OK, um, so you're transplanting, oh, transplanting them outside then. And then uh, what what's the work while they're growing? It's really just to keep them, keep the bed weeded, I think, isn't it? Yes, and the roots are very easily disturbed. Um, so uh, very shallow hoeing and hand weeding around the, the clumps of onions. That, uh, if you if you're transplanting a multi seeded module, that makes weed control a lot easier because you've only got one plant effectively every 30 centimeters you know yeah okay and are they a hungry hungry plants do they need a bit um, of you know uh, I, I they like a lot of compost but uh, as you know i don't do any feeding during the season or very little uh so a nice bit of compost i wouldn't put huge amounts of fresh dung on uh, because the excess nitrogen makes them far more prone to leaf diseases um so yeah, uh, a lot of they like a good healthy soil where the uh, plenty of potassium and phosphorus, but not huge amounts of nitrogen. Uh, a nice bit of compost with some seaweed meal uh, is a, is a good sort of mix, really. Yeah. Okay. Some people also used to use wood ash. You can use that as well for the potassium. Okay. And uh, final thing then, so harvesting. So so talk to us about kind of the difference between kind of green onions and and you know uh, like drying them out drying them out for storage and that that kind of size of it because i think that right. that's a bit confusing for people sometimes yeah yeah uh, a lot of people ask me when something ready it's when you decide it's ready to eat really you know the right size so you can you i use onions i say first thinning as scallions and then i've been harvesting regularly for the past three weeks a month for the kitchen here, green onions, so they're almost full size and chef uses the green stem and everything. 
Uh, then around so about that's, now, then, sorry, Richard, that's what you mean by green onions that the stem is yes, un, un, unripe large onions, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, then, um, if you want to dry them off, uh, what works best, uh, don't do any of this twisting your onions in the soil and all sorts of things that gardening books can recommend. Leave them till the uh, they've gone over naturally, don't bother bending them over, just wait for them to go over naturally. Uh, the stems flop over. Uh, lie on the ground, uh, pull them up, uh, leave them where they are in full sun uh, for a couple of weeks, and then uh, they've matured. Don't I, I? When I've done trials, I found taking them in and drying them in a, a, a polytunnel or glass house doesn't create such a good onion for storage as one that's left out for two weeks. Even in a traditional sort of late August, early September, bit of rain, bit of sun, bit of everything. Uh, it seems to get a good what we call a cure on them, like a finish on them, and they're then still. You might then still. Well, last year I had an excellent crop. The weather was really with me, and they were still through till February in the shed quite happily. Uh, but that was two weeks outside, followed by another week or two on the bench in the glass house, just to get really rustily dry at that stage. Yeah, and what if it's lashing rain for the two weeks outside? Like, um. A normal amount of rain uh, is grand, uh, you know, right. um, a, normal, a normal August of a bit of rain, but a sun. If uh, it's very, very wet, then you might want to raise them. I still leave them outside, but raise them off the ground on a bench or something so they're not lying on wet soil. Yeah, OK. Uh, OK. Yeah, but remember, the onion is a storage organ. It should store. It wants to live through the winter uh, and produce a, a seed head in the spring. So it's you're stirring something that wants to store, which makes life a lot easier. And then long term, like is, is a glass house or green or polytunnel going to be too hot to store them? Like, should you move them somewhere cooler for for kind of, you know, no, the they don't. Um, I won't go to the physiology <clears throat> of it, but you can actually store onions at relatively high temperatures if you want. Okay. Um, but uh, no, I, <clears throat> uh, I found that last year they stayed in crates in the glass house until I had room in the shed in sort of October, November time, and then I moved them into the shed. Now, if you want, uh, chef used them all up by February. Um, but if you wanted to store them much longer than that, they'd have gone in the fridge here because then their mission is accomplished. They'll then start sprouting unless they kept cool. Yeah. OK, so there's a question there on onions from Donna. I think what's the best planting time for seeds for spring onions? So. I guess we don't grow spring onions here. We Not use, directly. We use onions. Them. We use yeah, onions. Spring onions. onions. Um, well, uh, two two sowing seasons traditionally. There's the early one, uh, sort of March April into May, uh, and then there is uh, you can sow in August for overwintered uh, onions, and the, they don't do too well sown much later than well April really. Uh, because uh, the point I said about once it gets to midsummer, they decide they're going to bolt. So uh, yeah, and dry off. They'll dry off at that actually rather than bolt, but uh, they'll form an onion. And so two se separate sowing seasons for scallions and spring onions. Yeah, and I I did a, um, a sowing of of overwintering onion sets last last. Uh, I, I'm assuming. It sorry, was... you mean sorry, you mean spring maturing onions. I mean, no, I mean uh, overwintering onions. Yeah, so they're the spring maturing ones. Yeah, as a different yeah. to scallions, you know. Uh, yeah. So I sowed them, I think, September, and they had a, had a nice early crop, of, but they were in a polytunnel, and I had a nice early crop of, yeah. of onions in, I'd say, you know, I was able to eat them from around April onwards, which was kind yeah. of handy. They're, they're varieties which uh, need a shorter day to get the message to form a bulb. So they're the early season ones. And it's confusing for people. They're spring maturing onions okay. rather than the spring onions, you know, scallions. They're different things. OK, very good. All right, let's go to a couple of questions then. I think we've covered most things onions. Um, maybe just just to ask you about, have you any favourite varieties of onions? So, uh, just saw an interesting question appear there. Oh, about yeah. Cutting leaves off. OK, go for it. Uh, yeah, somebody said cutting leaves off. Don't cut the leaves off uh, when you're harvesting. Uh, commercially, you do, and then you dry them in forced air, barns and things. But back garden people, 
you pull an onion and dry it off, leaves and everything. And I found that uh, the best storage is from onions. You don't remove any of the brown scales or anything from the outside, leave them completely roots, tops, leaves, everything. Yeah. OK. And do you need to hang them like to store them? Not, uh, not necessarily. Uh, yeah, they, they I found they're still fine in crates, but you you probably get a bit longer storage out of them, keeping them nice and yeah. uh, dry and airy. Yeah. If ever yeah. I get the time and inclination to plat them, I probably will. But I'm not a platting sort of person. Really. Yeah, well, like there's a there's a there's a quicker thing than plaiting if you literally just just get a bunch of them and and just put some some. Uh, yeah, so you won't do them anything wrong. Keep them nice and airy in a cool shed. Yeah. Yeah, and keeps them away from mice and stuff if you hang them from. from yes, a crop, uh, yes, crop that's another whatever. thing, isn't it? Yeah. All right. So some some of the questions then non onion related. Uh, we had a question from Natalie. She she says she planted quite a lot of potatoes this year. What do you recommend I plant in the same rows next year, bearing in mind the crop rotation? Right. Um, you shouldn't put potatoes back in the ground for four years. Uh, people are vastly overcomplicated rotations. All you're doing is keeping the same family apart so you don't get a buildup of soil diseases. And if you grew potatoes in the same ground every year, you get a huge buildup of potato eelworms, which um, really would damage your yield. So. Uh, you don't want to grow potatoes. Any land that's had potatoes for another four years. But what to grow? Well, you will leave a few in the ground unless you're very, very careful of digging them all out. They're quite annoying in a small uh, seeded crop. Like you put carrots or something in that keep popping up and disturbing them. And the only way you can weed them is to dig them out. Uh, but anything that's not a small cedar crop is fine. You know, you, anything transplanted, your cabbages, your courgettes, anything that's not potatoes. OK, very good. Um, somebody somebody asks, is growing potatoes too tricky for beginners? I, I don't think so. I think they're no, quite, I think they're quite an easy one. thing to start with, aren't they? They are. I mean, you you the year like this year, you, well, you could well get blight. Uh, so if you either grow earlies, which are probably the most popular thing for beginners to grow because you, you don't have to wait too long, or grow a main crop, which is blight resistant. Um, and they will grow very well in a container in a raised bed. I one year did them in um, uh, a potato sack. I don't know where we got it from, actually, uh, home base or somewhere. But it, uh, you just put the potato in the bottom, and it keeps growing. You keep adding potting compost, and ended up with about five kilos of potatoes in the bag because you keep adding it, and it, uh, potatoes are about sort of 60 70 centimeters of uh, you know you keep sending sending them out as you cover the stems so no they'll grow very well they like a fair bit of food and and a fair and full sun and then they'll be happy okay so we, we've quite a few questions there from mike and a couple of others about um uh, uh cover crops and and green manure yeah. so it's a big issue at this time of the year obviously because you're taking out a lot of crops like onions and potatoes and things and a lot of a lot of bare soil. So do you want to speak speak to, to green manures and what they're about? Yeah, well, uh, the first thing is um, bare soil is bad. It's a good thing to remember in gardening. You, you, the soil is living, full of fungi, bacteria, all sorts of good things. And they essentially live on roots and other organic matter. So roots in the soil keeps it alive. Uh, so you want something growing. Your first choice would probably be in a small area. I mean, here, you probably noticed yesterday, Mick has flying around getting beds of corn salad in for the winter. So winter salad sown now. Uh, corn salad is great. Winter purslane is great. Um, they, uh, they can go in very happily for the next few weeks. And that's going to act as a green manure, i.e. roots in the soil, keeping it healthy. But you've got something handy to, to for a salad in the winter as well. Anything after about mid-September, I consider it a bit late for the salads in. And then I will uh, put in um, usually annual ryegrass. I buy it uh, seed and sow it, and that forms a really dense mat of roots uh, with the annual ryegrass, keeping the soil alive over the winter. But certainly for the next few weeks, any ground that comes available, I put winter salads in. Would you prefer green manures to say a really good pile of seaweed or or farmyard manure or or oh, compost? Very much so, yeah. Um, because uh, compost, farmyard manure, seaweed adds nutrients and a bit of life to the soil. 
but it's not keeping the soil alive over winter. I mean, I, I do both here, as you know. Uh, I have my green manures and my winter salad crops. And then when I get them ready in the spring, I put our own compost out on the bed as well. Uh, so there's room for both. But roots in the soil over the winter has an amazing impact on keeping it healthy and, and vibrant. Right. OK. Uh, somebody's saying it's a, it's it's a bit it's a bit like going into a travel agent and ask saying you want to go on holidays but you're not quite sure in the world where you want to go. But somebody says, uh, where should I start as an absolute beginner? <laughs> uh, radishes. Uh, um, right. uh, at the age of three, about thirty years ago now, um, I uh, I started with radishes. Um, and I've never looked back since. Uh, radishes and uh, the the quick grown salads, uh, things like mizzou, they're all ready in about a month. Uh, you sprinkle them on the surface, well, in, in the shallow drills, and you harvest away um, uh, about a month later. Uh, they can be, still be sown now. I'm putting radishes in this afternoon for an autumn crop in land that have potatoes in. Um, and you get something back very quickly, particularly, uh, you know, having a nice fresh ba a bag of salad or bowl of salad from your garden within a month. Now, surely nobody can resist putting more seeds in after that. You, yeah. You're bitten after that. Yeah, deadly. Um, so someone else asking about what's the best thing to do with veg beds at the end of the season. So I think we've covered that. Uh, what winter manure crop should I sow now? We talked about that as well. So you're saying ryegrass. I've also used the um, Landsberger mix from... Yeah, that's from mainly ryegrass and has a few uh, bits of clover and things in it. Now, clover is very useful because it fixes nitrogen over the summer. Not particularly useful in overwintered green manure because when the soil gets less than 10 degrees, the, there's no real nitrogen fixation goes on. So... Uh, the ryegrass is the thing that does the job, really. But there's no harm in having a few legumes in there as well. The clover. Yeah. So. OK. Uh, tips on growing blueberries. I think we covered this last month. And if I if I remember rightly, you were saying grow them in a pot. Uh, you put them outside in the winter because they like they like a good cold snap and put them inside in a greenhouse in the summer. Is that am I right in saying that? Yeah, you remembered that well, Nick. That's, that's it, really. I was, you and see, what I was of compost? Missing. I may, I may have looked bored, but I was interested. <laughs> I didn't think you listened to a word I said, Mick. Um, yeah, you, I mean, you put them in uh, ericaceous compost. It's still, as that's acidic compost for heathers and things. Uh, that's what they like. So put them in those. Yeah, deadly. Um, as big a container as you can manage. Is leaf mould recommended for planting seeds in? So No. Uh, no. Uh, leaf, leaf mould is an excellent addition to the garden. Uh, but uh, old world gardens I worked in in my younger days, the tradition was to stack the leaf mould in its own container and you use the stuff. You had three bays and you use the stuff from the last bay that had been sitting for two years every year. Uh, a lot of trees, uh, well, null trees put all their toxins into the leaves and they lose them in the autumn. It's how a tree goes to the toilet, essentially. It uh, gets rid of all the crap. And um, often these are things which suppress leaf growth. Anybody been for a walk in a beech wood, uh, you'll notice it is virtually bare underneath. And that's partly the beech uh, producing weed killers to kill everything off around it. Uh, so there's toxins in leaf mould that prevent seed germination. So it's a very bad thing to use. But all that lovely organic matter needs to get into your soil eventually. Uh, but leave it a long time or scatter it around something like an herbaceous border or something on the surface. OK, but would you would you use old leaf mould as as compost on veg beds or not at all? I would. There's no nutrients in it. It's obviously be a pretty stupid tree to get rid of uh, valuable nutrients in its leaves when it discards them. Um, uh, but it's superb organic matter. Uh, I would so you can mix it with the soil, but the best thing of all is to put it where it should be effectively in nature, which is as a mulch uh, on your fruit bushes or your flower border or whatever. You know, put it on the surface for the worms to take down. OK, but don't use it for planting seeds. No. Um, so uh, what would be a good good to plant in a winter container garden for a school project? Right. Uh, 
<clears throat> Again, if um, we've just had the, the teachers here, uh, had a lovely course last week with um, uh, primary teachers come for a, a course here in the summer. And yeah. I was recommending they all go back in September, the start of term, and sow things like the winter salads or radish or uh, um, uh, mizuna and so on, uh, on beginning of September in, mud, in containers, leave them outside. Uh, if you want to put something on a windowsill, then peas are handy to grow as greens, you know, as pea shoots. Uh, never enough light on a windowsill, but uh, all you're doing with a pea shoot really is sprouting it. So all the pea, pea goodness goes into the shoot. And if you want something to go through the winter, uh, put in broad beans in October or garlic in November, and um, that will grow through the winter for you. They'd, they'd prefer to be outside, though, those two, yeah? They would need to be outside, yeah. If you want yeah. something on a windowsill, uh, pea shoots are excellent because you can nibble, the, you can cut the pea shoots two or three times and uh, everybody can nibble a pea shoot. Very good. Um, so, uh, Finian says, my squash plants look healthy but are not producing viable fruits. What might the problem be? Sorry, my what plant, sorry? Squash. Squash oh yeah, it's a dreadful year for squash. They like, uh, they want to be somewhere warm, and that wasn't Ireland this summer. Uh, well, they had warmth in June, which is too early for them. They expect to have a damp cut then. Um, and certain varieties, I grow seven or eight varieties here to keep the kitchen happy. Uh, two or three varieties have virtually produced nothing this year, and they cropped heavily last year. Uh, butternut squash, hardly one out there. Uh, Delhi Carter, another one, hardly any of those. Uh, but a couple of the uh, the larger orange types uh, produce reasonably well, uh, and the smaller orange ones as well. So um, I would suspect it's just the year that's in it. It's a very poor year for growing squash. Yeah. Okay. And they're not gonna they're not gonna come good at this stage if they don't have fruit. Uh, they, on they've them. decided. If you have a look at mine now, you would think you're looking at the patch the end of September. They really think yeah. autumn's on the way. Okay. Only see something of a yield there, but about half the yield of last year. Yeah. Uh, so Finian, you have it. You have an excuse. Uh, you'll be glad to hear. Uh, and you can just blame the weather. Uh, or that's what all gardeners do, isn't it? Or the other. Yeah. Well, that's your stock answer to all your problems. It is. So. Yeah. And you fall for it every time, Mike. So there we go. <laughs> um, why am I successful? Liz asks. Why am I successful with some seeds like tomatoes, but a disaster with most others? That's that's a tricky one to answer. <coughs> I wouldn't know enough, really. Um, it's uh, to make. I mean, tomatoes, tomatoes are not. Fresh. Tomatoes are not particularly easy to to no. grow from seeds. So, Most I mean, seed you can do it with tomatoes. If, and also, tomatoes need a higher germination temperature than many things. So it's not that they're getting overexcited and sowing too early or anything. I really can't answer that. I'm afraid I don't have enough information. If the person wants to send a question. A more detailed question for the next session. We can have a go at answering yeah. it then. Maybe there's something in that point you made about the higher germination temperatures. Maybe it's too hot or something where she's sewing them. Yeah, it has to get Maybe. very hot for that, really. But only I don't know. Yeah. It has to get over um, 25 degrees to suppress any any crop, really. The next question is about green manures again. I think we've covered that. That was from Lorraine. Um, What's the best way to improve soil in raised beds? I've been adding rotted uh, dung most years, covering with my pecs over the winter, but I'm wondering, should I continue to do this or grow a cover crop over the winter or completely change the soil by removing and replacing with new soil? So I, I think that suggests that Mary is not getting a great result from her existing soil. Yeah, if um, it's possible with manure to add too much, compost it isn't. You know, they experimented in the tunnel here of growing tomatoes and cucumbers in pure compost um, yeah. and they grew great uh, you know there's uh, so with compost it's quite hard to add too much in my experience but manure you can because you can be adding too much nitrogen and so on uh, I certainly as I said before cover crop over the winter would be great and a good quantity of dung to add uh, no more than one bucket per square meter any more than that, and you're getting a bit overexcited, really. Um, but you'd you'd suggest then she grow a green manure over the. Oh winter, yeah, yeah. Have it, then... have something growing rather than the mypex. Uh, either green manure or um, have uh, you know salads over the winter. And if you are growing ryegrass green manure in you know, a ryegrass Landsberger mix, 
make sure it's killed off uh, at least a month before you want to sow or plant anything. Yeah. Because ryegrass produces a bit of a weed killer as well, so you need to have it very dead before the next crop comes in. Yeah, the, there could be also, she's saying she's using dung and then and then covering it with mypex, which is not, mypex is not, it, like will let will let light and, and water through anyway, won't it? So maybe it should yeah. be a, a plastic, a black plastic cover rather no, than... No, no, actually letting a bit, uh, uh, letting water in actually uh, keeps the worms going over the winter uh, better than a black plastic cover. Um, <laughs> I, I would suspect that she's possibly applying the dung's possibly slightly fresh and applying too much. Well rotted, one bucket a square meter, and have something growing over the winter, and you shouldn't have any problems, really. Okay. Um, somebody asked about ants. I had big problems with ants this year as well. I don't know. Was it a good? It seems I'd, like it was a good year for them. Um, I oddly enough, I mean, I have ants all over the garden, very much see as part of the ecosystem. I've never in this country come across ants that do me any harm. Uh, certainly when I worked in East Africa, there are ants that could do an awful lot of harm and termites used to destroy things. But uh, no, I've never come across it as a problem. I have ants living everywhere, uh, but um, I virtually encourage them. You know, they like living in the tunnel and things because they're part of an ecosystem. So yeah. I can't answer that. I've, I've never had ants causing a bother in my garden. Well, I tell you, I, I had a kind of a serious infestation of ants in one bed, one raised bed. And what were they uh, doing? They were eating. They were in the squash bed and they were actually all over the leaves of the squashes. And the, the, were they the eating ants. the squash or were they eating insects on the squash? I, I don't know. I didn't I didn't have time to study guess, it in that um, detail. I did a, a video with um, uh, put out on our network thing whatever it's called i don't know uh, yeah, social the, media it's called the uh, internet richard oh yeah that's yeah. that's the computer thing isn't it yeah uh of uh, aphids being farmed on my apple tree here uh the ants will look after aphids and milk them for honeydew mm. uh so i like the idea of another farmer on the same bit of land as me um and they're slightly knocking the apple tree back but it's just a fabulous thing to watch like a symbiotic relationship like that but uh, I should imagine the ants, um, uh, they, um, yeah, they, they're, pro they're probably not doing any harm. Anything crawling on your plants, have a good look that it's, uh, before you try and do anything about it, whether it's actually harming them, it might, it might not be doing any harm at all. I, I Catch it in the act of eating. Yeah, well, like I... I just got the impression that the ants were crawling all, all all over the leaves of the squashes and that the plants were really struggling as a result. But I could I could be wrong it's about that. It possibly is indirect. It, I, I'm sure there were probably aphids on the leaves, mm. and they were they were what they do is keep things like ladybirds off the aphids. So indirect uh, and to encourage the uh, aphids, uh, you know, to produce honeydew for them. Uh, so they're defending them. Um, but uh, I suppose, yeah, the aphids themselves, like the apple tree that I had, it was a little bit knocked back. But I think it's such a lovely thing to watch that um, I uh, I tend to leave it, really. I think yeah. squashes are struggling this year because the weather. The aphids probably added an extra bit. I mean, yeah, in, your, in that case, I'd have gone to kill the aphids rather than the ants. So you'd probably kill both at the same time. Yeah. OK, so let, let's let's rifle through a couple of the next questions because I want to move on to seed sa seed saving. So uh, pa uh, peppers attacked by green fly. Um, how, any suggestions how to, to deal with this? Well, I saw at the end of the question, they were looking at it earlier and the person said the peppers weren't harmed. Yeah. Which uh, so that's the classic organic gardening thing. If there's no harm being done, uh, leave them. Um, but uh, I found uh, I, I never ever spray for aphids in, my, in the garden here. I find that with my natural balance, uh, if I just leave it be, uh, various predators will come and take them. And on peppers, it seems to be uh, very small wasps that are parasitizing them, laying eggs in them, and you get mummified aphids uh, after a week or two, and the 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 peppers are fine. Um, so. I would suggest part of the fun of having a garden is to watch these dramas happening, really. Yeah. Um, so if they're not doing any harm, leave them be. Yeah, OK. Um, 
I kind of get though. Like, let, let's say you were having green fly attacking a basil plant in the kitchen. You don't, you don't want to leave that be. So, what would you do in that case? So some more basil. Um, no, I would. I'd, I'd wash the leaves to use them. You know, I, uh, I certainly wouldn't want to spray an insecticide. Um, no. Uh, even the organic ones that your organic growers can use, like pyrethrum, are just poisons out, out, out of a plant. You know, they're no different effectively. I mean, I could use them here as an organic grower, but I choose not to. And people use things like uh, fairy liquid, uh, trade name, isn't it? Washing up liquid and so on. Uh, that will kill them, um, uh, wash them off. Just straight water, though. If you get a jet of water, aphids don't cling on very hard. So washing them off is as effective as anything. And okay. also getting them wet, uh, getting the leaf wet really uh, annoys aphids intensely. So wash the leaves with a uh, a jet sprayer, uh, you know, like uh, either with a pump sprayer or uh, put your nozzle on your hose pipe onto jet and wash it off. OK, someone asking about uh, uh, Des, I think, uh, um, when do you know beetroot and carrots are ready for picking? I think we covered this already. When they're you big know? enough to eat, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say that, yeah. Uh, beef root generally around sort of, you know, between golf ball and tennis ball size, I guess, and carrots, you know, when they look big enough at the top of the, at the top of the, yeah, you know, pull, the always have a quick look, pull one or two up and, uh, I mean, fingling carrots are great. My kids used to love them at that size, you know, when they're uh, just I think it's a little finger uh, or grow any bit, any size up from there, really. Yeah. I've even okay. had chef using thinnings uh, in salads, but that's chef here, really. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about seed saving because we're we've about seven minutes left. Uh, if we're to finish on time, which we never do, um, what what are your like? I I think I think a lot of people are a lot of like home growers. Certainly, when they start, they're a bit turned off or a bit afraid of seed saving. Um, but uh, it's obviously an amazing thing to do um, and quite straightforward with some vegetables. What, what would be your sort of your go to uh, veg for seed saving? In a way, things that produce seeds anyway uh, to harvest them. So uh, broad beans, uh, runner beans, French beans, peas, they're all very straightforward. Uh, Runner beans can cross with another variety if there's somebody up the road, but that's not the end of the world. I still be runner beans. Um, they're all handy. Now, squashes, you know, courgettes, pumpkins and so on, they have more of a tendency to cross pollinate, which again isn't the end of the world. You might just get an unusual shaped one afterwards. But um, if you only have one variety in your garden, then you should be fine unless you have somebody very close, a neighbour growing them. Uh, you know, they... They naturally have seeds in any way, your pumpkins or whatever. So if you just have one variety, you should be fine. Uh, they're very easy. And then things that don't naturally produce seeds, but can be produ can produce seeds very um, easily. Uh, the uh, brassica salad crops, rocket, mizuna, mustard, they are, but only grow one of them unless you want to cross them, which again isn't the end of the world if they cross for a back garden grower. Uh, I used to save seed commercially uh, for my salad business out of one variety a year. And out of a few square meters, you get a kilo of seed if you wanted to. So they're quite handy. And then you're getting into slightly more difficult things, which is possibly outside the scope here. Tomatoes. Now, uh, that's quite popular. Uh, grow an open pollinated variety, not a hybrid tea variety, an F1 hybrid of tomatoes. They're self-pollinating, so they should breed true or usually self-pollinating. And uh, what you want is a seed to ferment a little bit, strangely enough. So they come out in their goo in the middle of the tomato, leave them in that for a couple of days till it gets a bit smelly, maybe, maybe three or four days. And then, um, so you think they've gone rotten, but that is actually to break down the chemicals on the seed coat, which prevent germination. That's when a tomato falls on the floor, rots and produces seed. Uh, then rinse it off, dry it off on a, a bit of um, tea towel or something. Never use kitchen roll for these sort of things because everything sticks to everything uh, in the windowsill. And then you've got some seed um, from tomatoes. Uh, a couple of people sent in questions I noticed about saving seed, uh, i.e. Yeah. storing seed is uh, they meant. Uh, a lot of seed will store for a very long time. I sowed uh, broccoli here that was seven years old uh, this year, 
fine the germination but make sure if you're going to achieve that you store seeds dry and cool i could store them in plastic boxes with uh, silica gel in the stuff that you get from cameras and binoculars and, and shoes apparently not that my safety boots have, have the him but uh, and handbags as well um but you put those in in the dry that keep the seeds dry but it's very variable i've never sow one year onion seed what onion seeds go off after a year but things like cabbage, broccoli, radish will last five or more. If you have seeds left over, put maybe uh, five or ten seeds in a Tupperware container on a bit of tissue paper or something. Keep them in the hot press and see what the germination is. So you're doing a, a germination test. Commercial growers will do that with last year's seed. You take 100 seeds and get a percentage germination. So before you put them in the ground, you can always check. But yeah, onions, carrots, parsnips don't store well. Cabbage, broccoli does, peas and beans, maybe two or three years. Very Ignore good. the sell by date on the pack. That's <clears> just a packing date. Nothing to do with how long they'll last. OK, uh, somebody asked, can you save seeds from shop bought fruit and vegetables? I suppose your problem no. there is they might not be open pollinated. Uh, they might be from a different climate uh, and um, if the things like courgettes, I mean, I grow three or four varieties of courgettes, all my, they'll all be cross pollinating with each other. So if you're buying my courgettes, no telling what you'd get out of them. So no, uh, grow them yourself, really. Yeah, OK. Uh, are there any ones that you wouldn't uh, like that are very hard to save seeds from? Uh, now, because I've only saved seed from easy things, uh, I can't really answer that. Um, yeah. I only save seeds from the things that are very straightforward. Uh, possibly I suppose, I suppose the, the kind of biannuals, so carrots and things like that, where you'd have to let them go, you know, let them go to flower and seed. It just it would just take a long time, I guess. It would, it? wouldn't it? It'd take a lot of time for, <laughs> an, for a back garden grower. You'd have the bed occupied. And actually, even um, things like broad beans, uh, they're, they're ready in May, June as a, you know, green beans to harvest. Uh, the people harvesting field beans are getting the combines out now. They're not really dry till August, September. So they'll occupy the ground for that sort of time. So it, it is quite ground occupying. Yeah. Um, peas are quicker than that. Um, yeah, uh, that's a question uh, that, as I say, I've never tried the difficult ones, but uh, definitely, uh, anybody who's really interested, get in touch with Irish Seed Savers. That's yeah. a superb organisation, and it can become a hobby in its own right. And if someone's asking that question, it sounds like they've gone beyond my level of knowledge and need to get in touch with Seed Savers. Yeah, uh, as you say, an amazing organisation doing doing very They're important, great very important work. Um, so I think that's mainly the, the seed saving questions. There was someone asking about say, how do you save courgette seeds? I'm assuming that's pretty straightforward because they're inside the yeah, courgette. Grow yourself um, a, uh, a marrow, not a courgette, obviously. It needs to become a mature fruit and leave it on till it starts uh, almost, you know, like really hard skin and starting to look a bit rotten almost. Uh, that is how the seeds will naturally produce, and then take them out when the when the thing is completely mature. You won't okay. get mature seeds out of something that's a courgette. It has to become a great big marrow. Okay, yeah, that's good advice. Um, uh, and lettuce seed, you you need to let you need to let the lettuce run run to seed and produce. Yeah, they're, they're quite the potentially a good one. You get a huge number of seed from one lettuce plant. Um, that's a good one. When it's starting to mature, pull it up uh, and hang it upside down and maybe put it into a paper bag, the seed head, because the seeds tend to mature at different times in, in the, that family. And they'll, some will be ready, some won't at the same time. So put it in a paper bag and let them fall. OK, very good. Um, all right. So um, what else do we need to talk about? There's quite a few questions left but I'm not sure we have time. Maybe just uh, to say that we will be following up. We'll, we'll circulate all the questions and answers um, after, the, after the call to anyone who's registered for it uh, with details of next month's uh, session. So just, just maybe finish, Richard, by talk, talking to us about sort of key tasks for the month of September. What's, what's big in your mind about what you need to do 
Well, it, it uh, very to, much follows keep, with the... Keep yourself very busy and productive as you, as you of always course, are. Of course, Am I ever anything else? Uh, no, I'm, I'm starting... This is one of the odd time of year I take a bit of leave, actually. Um, uh, yeah. I did, actually, I don't know whether I told you that. Um, no, you didn't. No, for, for the autumn, um, very much now getting ground covered. A lot of the questions are about that now. I don't want to go into the uh, the winter with bare ground. So any ground that becomes available, the quicker I turn it around, the better. So we harvested onions on one bed yesterday morning. Uh, by the afternoon, I had beds, had compost down and beds sown with uh, corn salad for a winter salad. So, uh, I mean, a, a day in um, August is worth two days in late September. So, you know, move very quickly to get the ground covered is my big part of my thinking. Yeah, OK, that's really good advice. And we're still a little off from sowing things like broad beans and garlic and those big kind of winter. So, yeah, that's um, if you go too early with them, they get overexcited in the autumn and they're out of kilter for the winter. Uh, the uh, mid to the end of October is perfect time for broad beans. Uh, end of October onwards is uh, good for garlic. I found if you go earlier in October, uh, garlic isn't as vigorous over the winter. It seems to like to go into the slightly cooler ground in, in very late October, early November. Yeah, OK, brilliant. Uh, well, look, have, uh, I hope everybody has a good uh, a good uh, month ahead and we'll see you back at the, uh, the last Friday in September. In the meantime, obviously, there's loads of resources on the GIY website. Um, and if you follow us on social media, any any of the channels really, uh, you'll see regular sort of uh, videos from myself and Richard uh, every, yeah, every is that week. Where they go? Mm. That's where they go. Exactly. Right. Um, and and Richard is 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 turning into quite the social media star at this stage. He's sort of usurping me at this point, um, which I'm very annoyed about. But there you go. Um, so well, I'm not us. even aware of it. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that's often the way. The more oblivious you are to these things, the better. Uh, so check those out. There's loads of really good information coming on those and uh, have, have, have a good month. Happy growing in the meantime. Yeah, Thanks get your again. ground sown. Get it covered for the winter. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Richard. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, everyone.